If there's one thing that you can say about the development of industry in the United States is that it's going to have political consequences and fallout in uh, American life. No one really reflects this idea better than the political career of Andrew Jackson. Jackson was a self-made man. Um, he wasn't one of these Thomas Jefferson, John Adams types that was an intellectual. Um, he came across military science and later on political science um, almost naturally. And what he's going to represent in his time in the White House is the common man. Um, he's also going to represent a very effective form of winning elections, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. But for right now, I need you to understand that not everybody is essentially drinking the Jacksonian Kool-Aid, okay? To be sure, there is plenty of opposition toward Andrew Jackson. Um, one issue that people took with Jackson was a concept that came to be known as patronage. One of the things that Jackson does upon entering into the White House is he goes ahead and he dismisses all of John Adams' administration's um, advisors, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Treasury. All of these guys are going to be dismissed by Andrew Jackson, and he'll replace them with what might loosely be called his buddies. Um, now, we don't really think too much of that today. Um, we, we pretty much take it for granted that the outgoing administration's advisors will be replaced and appointed with new ones. Um, this is something that we pretty much take for granted, but at the time, in the middle of the 19th century, that was a relatively new practice, and a lot of people perceived that to be a rather odd thing to do. Uh, you would want consistency. You would want to keep the expertise of the Secretary of State, for example, in one place for at least another four years. Let them do their job. People don't like Jackson's concept of patronage, uh, to which he said, listen, if you have a problem with this, I have a very simple solution, and that's win elections. Uh, losing has consequences in politics. Jackson had personal rivals as well. Um, one was his one-time vice president, a guy by the name of John C. Calhoun, who we've talked about in this class before. But it went so much further than just their political butting of heads. Um, John C. Calhoun's wife, uh, Florentine Calhoun, had orchestrated what would later become known as the Petticoat Affair. The Petticoat Affair involved the wives of the Jackson administration uh, really teaming up against uh, an advisor, a guy by the name of John Eaton, and his wife, a lady by the name of Peggy. And what these wives did is they really ostracized, especially Peggy, made them feel like outsiders. And this was something that Jackson just simply never got over. And one of the things that he insisted upon in the aftermath of this petticoat affair is absolute and unflinching loyalty. And part of that loyalty descended all the way down to the wives, people like Peggy. He felt it was absolutely terrible for morale inside the White House to have any sort of division. We all need to be on the same page. And if you can't be on the same page, whether this is petty jealousies or political rivalries, Hey, right there's the door, okay? Again, from the outside looking in, this looks like he's really drawing an absolute line when it comes to governing. And Calhoun would continue to take issue with Andrew Jackson as such. As a matter of fact, people of the Calhoun variety referred to Jackson as King Andrew I. And where they're going with this, if you're following along in the PowerPoint, um, that's what I'm discussing right now. You're looking at an image of King Andrew. They saw him as functioning much more like a monarch than a democratically elected official. Calhoun in particular felt that Andrew Jackson had overstepped his authority, especially in Calhoun's home state of South Carolina. Keep in mind, the force bill is aimed at South Carolina to get them to comply with federal law. And so there are people of the Calhoun variety that see Andrew Jackson as a threat to American liberty, 
and, and they are going to form an opposition organization for those purposes. Now, this organization that I'm talking about is going to come to be known as the Whig Party. Similar to the Democratic Party, um, this group of political thinkers, for lack of a better term, um, wanted something that was very easy to remember. Democracy, the Democratic Party, that was very easy to remember. The Whig Party had been known in England as a political organization. It was very easy to remember. So naturally, what Calhoun and other people like him did is they named their political organization the Whig Party. The platform of the Whig Party, its central idea, really focused on really two things. One was the emphasis on industry, individualism, and an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, not everybody within the Whig organization really celebrated the idea of entrepreneurship, and certainly they had a broad definition for it. But generally, the people that did um, had a great enthusiasm for what you and I would probably call a hand up. Okay, um, Let me give you a couple quick examples. One really big fan of this Whig ideology, and probably the most famous Whig, Henry Clay, uh, that was the one-time member of the party, a guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln idolized Henry Clay and was one time a card-carrying member of the Whig Party. And in the 1860s, it's Lincoln that is really going to accelerate the development of the railroad industry. Um, he's going to have government assistance really kind of take the lead when it comes to laying an industrial infrastructure that would allow people like uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt and John D. Rockefeller and um, some of these other Gilded Age moguls to really uh, take that American economy to the next level. It's under Lincoln's watch that we see something called the Moral Land Grant Act, which establishes universities that you and I call Texas A&M, uh, Michigan State University, Penn State University. Um, these land-grant schools were government-owned territories that uh, the states, Michigan, Texas, Pennsylvania, would later donate to institutions of higher learning uh, where they would proceed to train the next generation of engineers, um, they would train the next generation of agriculturalists and people that could generally help the American economy. So this wasn't a hand out. It wasn't, you know, free college tuition. Uh, what it was was a hand up. We'll build the railroad, how you use the railroad, um, how you use Penn State University is ultimately up to you. There is another dynamic within the Whig organization, and that is opposition to Andrew Jackson. Some people, and John C. Calhoun absolutely fell into this category, they became Whigs primarily because Jackson was a Democrat, and in a lot of ways they simply wanted to spite him. I'll give you a very good example of who I'm talking about, or another example as to who I'm talking about a little bit later in this lecture today. For right now, I want to talk about Henry Clay. Um, Henry Clay is probably going to be the most important Whig, um, certainly the most famous one during this period uh, right now, uh, late 1830s, early 1840s. And we know uh, Clay, we know that he favored a modernization campaign for the American economy. He favored a series of roads and bridges and canals, and generally what he was trying to do is make it easier to do business in the United States. Um, he encouraged banking, um, wanted to renew the Central Bank of the United States. He encouraged economic protectionism, levying tariffs, making British manufactured goods uh, more expensive and consequently less desirable than their American counterparts. He encouraged the rule of law, um, uh, written in unchanging constitutions uh, that could protect the interests um, for the minority against the, 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 what he called the tyranny of the majority. Um, simply because something was not popular did not mean that it would not pay dividends and would not be a very good thing later on in, um, in, in time. Now, think about who the Whig Party is primarily going to appeal to. Think, think clearly about this. It makes business easier to do in the United States. It protects businesses. 
naturally the Whig Party, especially in the North, is going to be favored by businessmen. To a lesser extent, people that might be referred to as moralists, uh, reformers, but certainly the business community likes the idea of federally subsidized roads, centralized banks, uh, economic protectionism. This is going to become a force to be reckoned with in the coming years. I also want you to understand that the Whigs are not the only political organization on the rise. Um, you do see the establishment of what would come to be known as the Working Man's Party. As you might imagine, the Working Man's Party was consistent or made up of individuals that might loosely fall into the category of working class. Um, it's not quite as simplistic as I'm making this, but certainly there were workers that were card-carrying members of the Working Men's Party, and what they wanted to do is elect people of their own variety, or at least people that might be in favor of legislation and reform that was uh, going to lift up the standard of living for working-class Americans. There's a dark side to this as well. There would continue to be a dark side to this well through the, the late 19th century. Those of you that go on to take modern American history will get this. What you begin to see in the East is immigration from places like Ireland and Germany. What you see in the West, especially later on in the century, is immigration from Japan and to a much greater extent China. And all the old stereotypes associated with immigrants uh, that they take jobs, that they brought crime, that sort of thing. They were alive and well in, in the mid-19th century when the Working Men's Party was really kind of coming of age. There's a dark side to American populism, and in the case of the Working Men's Party, that, that dark side was uh, manifested in its anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, again, this is more of a more modern American history story than anything else, but uh, there was huge waves of opposition to Chinese immigration in California, so much so that uh, even mainstream politicians, Democrats and Republicans, would have to respond to it, and ultimately they respond by banning Chinese immigration in 1882, more or less entirely. And so this is maybe the dark side of popular politics in that way. But keep in mind, Working Man's Party, and to a much lesser extent, the Whig Party, they're, they're new organizations. And if you follow American politics, you know that brand new political entities, they don't tend to do very well in their first you know, stages of their political lives. 1836 is an election year, and Andrew Jackson, right before he left Washington, he hand-selected the guy that was going to take over the Democratic Party and, for the most part, have a very good likelihood of being elected president. And that was the guy that was so essential in helping him formulate the Democratic Party, the man that you're looking at on the screen there, um, Martin Van Buren of New York. Um, Van Buren is going to win the election very, very easily, right? But here's the problem with saying it that way. The Whigs are going to run in this election in 1836. They're not going to run one candidate or even two candidates or three or four candidates. They're going to run five different candidates. So if you can kind of connect the dots here, what those five Whigs are going to do is they're going to break apart people that would be likely to vote for the Whigs in five different directions. They will split the vote. Um, that's going to give a huge advantage to Van Buren, who will win easily. That's what I mean when I say he won easily. But if you took all of those five Whigs and you combined their votes, you would have gotten to close to 49% of the popular vote. So if you're Whig, this is really good news. You're a brand new political organization. Nobody knows who you are, not really. And right out of the gate, you're close to 50%. If you can settle on one, not five, but one person, and you can really focus your organizational efforts, 1840 looks like you might be in business. For right now, I want to take you back to the trap that Henry Clay thought he was setting for Andrew Jackson, and that involved the banks. If you were with us the last time we met, the trap for Andrew Jackson that Henry Clay had devised involved um, sending legislation to the president to get him to recharter that Bank of North America, knowing full well Jackson probably wasn't going to do that. 
And so what ends up happening is um, he doesn't veto the bank, which is exactly what Henry Clay was hoping he would do, because Henry Clay assumes that this would kill the economy. And what he, what, he, what, he, what he assumed wrongly is that this would be instantaneous. It doesn't happen in a bang-bang sort of dynamic. It takes years to catch up. It catches up in 1837, the year that Andrew Jackson left the, the White House. In 1837, you get this economic crisis that we call the Panic of 1837. Simply put, the, the, the closing of the North American bank is a very central part in all of this. Because what Jackson did with those assets that the bank once upon a time had is he put them on what critics would call his pet banks. And these pet banks had made a, shall we say, few really bad advised loans. Uh, people defaulted on those loans. And if you know anything about credit, when, when, when banks are you know, left holding the bag for loans, that's when they stop putting out money in the American economy. When that happens, you're in the, you're in the territory of economic depression. You really have a drying up of credit. That's really what caused the panic of 1837. But I'm much more interested in the results. The results are widespread suffering. Lots of unemployment in these industrial centers, uh, New York, Boston, um, um, Lowell, Massachusetts, lots of, lots of suffering. It was said that workers were freezing to death in the streets. In the South, you had a massive foreclosure on land. Uh, Mississippi is a good example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, people that simply could not afford to pay their note anymore, the bank foreclosed upon them and they auctioned off massive chunks of land in that state that year. And so you've got chaos in the economy, and anytime you've got that, what the American voters generally do is they blame the president. Uh, rightly or wrongly, it's going to be Van Buren that is blamed for this disaster. Now, this is a great opportunity for the Whigs. The Whigs have everything in line in 1840. Um, they've They've, they've got an economic crisis that they certainly didn't cause. And more importantly, from 1836 to 1840, they, they had learned their lesson. They realized that they needed to settle on one candidate, and they needed that to be a very compelling candidate. What they found was a guy from Ohio by the name of William Henry Harrison. I'm going to have you remember him as Tippecanoe, because what Harrison was was the war hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe. If you think back to the War of 1812 and this preemptive strike against Tecumseh and these Native Americans that are getting together at the village of Tippecanoe to make war against the U.S. government, Harrison delivered that preemptive strike that knocked them out before the fight was even on. And that really kind of um, enshrined him in the uh, glory of American military history. And the nickname just stuck, Tippecanoe. All right. Um, if there's one thing that we love to do is we love to elect military heroes. The Whigs found themselves a military hero, complete with a cool nickname, just like Andrew Jackson. Maybe even better than that, um, there was a guy from South Carolina named John Tyler, and he was a Whig as well. Um, and so the jingle of the day in 1840 as the election approached was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. It was easy to remember, it was fun to say, and on election day, voters overwhelmingly elected Tippecanoe. Here's the problem with Tippecanoe. Tippecanoe was 68 years old when he was elected and inaugurated, which is not very old by our standards. Certainly you've had presidents that have been older, um, but that was relatively up there in age in, in, in the 1840s. The other problem that Harrison's gonna have is on his inauguration day, it, it was a cold, rainy day in Washington, but he insisted on giving this long speech on the White House balcony. And long story short, he caught himself a cold, which rapidly developed into pneumonia. And about 30 days into his presidency, he keeled over dead, right? Um, I used to like to joke that uh, Tippecanoe was one of the worst presidents, arguably the worst president in American history, because he only lasted 30 days. So we didn't get Tippecanoe and Tyler II. We got Tyler II. And Tyler... Tyler himself is a very good example as to who I was talking about when it comes to Whigs that became Whigs simply to stick it in the craw of Andrew Jackson. 
Keep in mind, Tyler's from South Carolina, which meant that he had an old axe to grind through the force bill and the ordinances of nullification. He was a Whig because he hated Andrew Jackson. But for all intents and purposes, he's not a Whig, meaning politically and ideologically, he doesn't really fit in with the Whigs. He's from South Carolina, which means that he doesn't really love industry all that much. Um, he, he certainly doesn't like the, the agenda that Henry Clay, um, you know, now part of the Congress, is putting on his desk and expecting him to sign. John Tyler vetoes measure after measure after measure that Henry Clay is putting in front of him. And from the perspective of poor Henry Clay, I mean, appreciate his perspective for a second. Here he had waited four long years, hoping and praying a Whig would win the election. One does. He dies 30 days into the presidency, and the guy that's uh, now in the White House is basically a Democrat and won't work with him. So in 1844, you have another election, and it's an election where, on the one hand, John Tyler doesn't have a party. The Whigs hate him. They're not going to nominate him. The Democrats won't nominate him because he, once upon a time, was a Whig. So they're not going to nominate John Tyler. They'll nominate somebody else altogether. It's also going to get the Democrats a very good four-year opportunity to really rethink their approach to politics. And they will settle on not only a man, um, uh, 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 James K. Polk, but also a philosophy, uh, a philosophy of annexation and geographic expansion. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about once we get to the section of this class that I typically refer to as Manifest Destiny. But for right now, that's where I want to leave it.